Uh, morning, 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 everybody. How you doing? Welcome back to the Spurs Talk Show. It's been a while, hasn't it? I really apologise uh, for the last week's tardiness in content, guys. I've been so unwell in a variety of different ways. Not like any one thing, but just a number of things compounding on themselves, which has made my desires to be in front of a camera about as low as they could get. But I'm back now. I'm feeling good enough to get back. And I've got so much to catch up with you on. Nottingham Forest game. I haven't spoken to you about that. Uh, I'm not going to. I'm going to try and organise the devil's advocate if Dave and Johnny are around for either today or tomorrow afternoon. And hopefully we can go through it in more detail then. Uh, but there's three or four transfer news. Players that are all unbelievable talents that are being heavily linked with Tottenham. Three of them from the same club. A club that I absolutely admire. And... I think all four of the players, if we were to sign them, would, would be level ups. They're not, they don't solve all of the issues and they don't specifically go after the six, which you know I think is my priority. However, we'll, we'll come to that in a minute. Guys, if you're new to the channel, please hit the subscribe button. Even if you're not new, then double check you still are because of YouTube shenanigans. Hit the like button either way, please. Just smash the like button for me. If you've missed me, hit the like button. If you haven't missed me, hit the like button. The likes really, really do matter. Hit the notification bell and drop a comment, let me know your thoughts on today's topic. So but before we get into the four transfer stories that I found, and as I say, one of them is a, is a rehash of an old one, but it's heating up. The story is getting, getting stronger, more and more palpable and powerful links are being, uh, or journalists are linking us to him and saying that it's a straight shootout between us and one or two other clubs. There's another player that's been in, lurking in the background and a player that I don't think anyone I've ever met in a Tottenham community doesn't think is sensational. And I think would be brilliant as cover or rotation or versatility around the James Madison-esque role. Another centre-back and a striker. But we'll come to that in a second because when you're thinking about the value of some of those players, you also have to consider or the value of what we're seeing at the moment. And are the gaps that we think there are in the squad, are they getting smaller as the games are going on because... I've asked this question a hundred times to you guys. What's the difference between, you know, Ange Ball in the first 10 games and now, recently, and going forward? You know, if you've only got a one-way style of playing football, which we all agree we do have, then you've got to get better at it quicker than the opposition can figure it out. When we started the season, nobody had seen us play this football, and I think we caught a lot of teams by surprise, by the speed and ferocity of our never-ending attacks. And there's always people in the space because of the triangles and the inverted wing backs. It's like you have 13 men on the pitch when you have the ball. But bit by bit, it started to get figured out. And then we kicked on again. And so it's this game of cat and mouse. You know, you can either be flexible with your managerial style and then you never know which version of a team you're going to see, like an Unai Emery might do. Um, or the fella from uh, Palace Glasner, he's someone who's more kind of uh, exploitative. And so you, you're going to have to set up the way you want to play, but you're not sure really whether or not the tactics that they set up on the day are going to be good enough to compete. They, uh, David Moyes is another one, another perfect example. But if you are a game theory manager, which Ange is, then you have to figure out, like, are the problems in the squad that I have now, are there, is the frustrations with certain areas, like the wingers at the moment, are they short-lived, short-termed, because they just don't understand the game yet? They don't understand my system yet? And that's the sort of you know, million-dollar question. We don't know. Some people have made their minds up on certain players like Brennan Johnson and on Timo and on Richarlison and say, if you want to get to the top, then you know, those boys are not going to get you there. Even if they do learn the system and become better versions of themselves, the ceiling that they have is not the ceiling that you know, a title-winning team would, would look to. And I, don't, I think that's harsh on people like Brennan Johnson because he's so young. I think it's harsh on Kulusevski because you forget he's only 23 and we know, it's got, we know he's got form and levels in him that we're just not seeing at the moment. With Richarlison, you know, you know how I feel. Maybe you know, this is going to be contrary to the whole point of the video, but I just don't, I don't believe he does have the level consistently enough and Timo Werner well we've seen a player in the past who was one of the world's best that's why he got the move to Chelsea in the first place and then we've seen another version of Timo Werner that is incredibly frustrating and you know kind of embarrassingly bad with with his his moments 
But what you are seeing with our forwards increasingly now, recently, so the Fulham game was a write-off. I'm putting that down as a bad day at the office. But what, you're, what I've been seeing, since we've started to get our full squad back, the last piece of the puzzle to click, for me, has been the wide men in having the desire to take players on. Now, we know Kulusevski doesn't want to do it. He wants to cut back in, and that's like a mental block for him. I'm sure that he is being asked to, to do more of that by, Brent, uh, by Postacoglu, and yet, he, and yet he prefers to cut back in on his left-hand side. But what you're seeing from Brennan Johnson on the right and increasingly Timo Werner on the left is a willingness to now to use their pace, to shape their body weight uh, in a certain way. And with the case of Timo Werner, similar to Perisic, but less step overs, but just more acceleratory you know, pace to get to the, to, to the byline and whip it in. And then the other winger is at the back post. Brennan Johnson has been a, recipro- a recipient of Timo and Timo has been a recipient of Brennan Johnson. So the system is starting to work. It's starting to click. It's nowhere near perfect. We've still got to figure out the first half. We've still got to be better in the defence. I, I think we've still got to have a player in that six who can just sit and protect and, and allow the others, the, the, the fullbacks, to have the confidence to drive forward. But in the Forest game, you see Pedro Porro score another goal. I mean, an unbelievable return from a right back. If you call him a right back, I don't, I don't know. You know, people don't call Trent Alexander-Arnold a right back. Maybe Pedro Porro is not really a right back either. Mickey, Mickey Van der Ven, he's the one person that's not supposed to be in the penalty area. He's supposed to be one of the guys that's on the back just in case of the transition. So we're we are so far up the pitch, and we're adapting and we're learning, and I think the players are getting more and more confident with it. And by the way, Mickey Van der Ven's finish for. A, anybody that the way that the ball rolled across to him the weight of his first touch which was just delicately strong enough that it rolled into space to get the angle but not too not too uh, over hit that he wouldn't be able to, to get to the ball in time and it was rolled slowly enough so that he could connect the ball perfectly with you know his timing of his shot absolutely phenomenal this what a player we have what a player we have so i'm just the reason i'm saying all this nonsense and waffle for seven minutes is because when we're looking at forwards and we're judging what we need for next season, then to me, the question is, are we judging players before they've figured out the game? You know, are you saying you're a bad player before you've really learned the game? And his game, Postacoglu's game, is slightly different. But I think we're seeing more and more. And the takeaways for me, more so than the performance, more so than anything else, was the... Uh, the individual learnings and the, the, the demonstrations of growth in being what's asked to being what's delivered. Now, you sprinkle in a few pieces of more magic in there, then obviously, depending on the speed in which they pick up those signals, they pick up those training lessons, then Tottenham can go to the next level 100%. But if you sprinkle in too many, and those players take a long time to settle in, to learn the system, to learn the model, to learn Ange Ball then are you going to be frustrated next season when you've signed five or six players in the summer, but none of them, but the results on the, or the performances on the pitch almost stagnate a little bit because those guys aren't going to have picked it up quite as quickly as we would hope, similar to how players like Timo or Brennan Johnson or Kulusevski, for example, um, did as well this season. And that's where strikers come in and signings come in. And this is where I'm going to bring to you the names. I'm going to start off with, I'll tell you the club. The club we're linked with everywhere, guys, is RB Leipzig. And I love RB Leipzig. I think they're a brilliantly well-run outfit. I think they're very fortunate that they are the top of the pyramid in the uh, the Red Bull system so that they manage to be able to get the very best players from Salzburg at a higher frequency. I mean, those two clubs transact with each other at four times the average frequency of any other club which to me tells me there's no conflicts. The idea that there's no conflicts of interest is nonsense. But one of those players that moved from Salzburg to Leipzig a couple of years ago was um, Benjamin Sesko. Six foot, four and a half inch, lanky striker. A wonderful, wonderful player. A player I absolutely adore to watch. He's he's not sluggish. He's, He's fast for his height, but he's great in the air. 
He's got an amazing shot uh, con conversion ratio. Like the amount of shots he has to the amount of shots that are on target is about 80%. And then the amount of shots that are on target to the amount of goals that he scores is about 45% or something like that. So like you're giving, the, you're giving the ball in the right position, he's a finisher. But he's so, he's so clever with his positional play as well. The way he reads the game, the way he can just pull back and delay let delay his runs into space. He is someone that I think would work fantastically well on with this system in the nine when you've got someone like Timo Werner or someone like the next guy I'm going to talk about um, bombing down the left-hand side, doing their jukes and jinx and then being able to put the ball into the right area. He's the sort of person who understands where the right area is at the right time and will find it. Sesco left Salzburg for Leipzig for 25 million when Manchester United allegedly bid 50 million, which again goes to show you the corruption in the multi the idea that multi club ownership is okay as long as there's Chinese walls. It's nonsense. And he's apparently on Tottenham's radar this summer. And a lot of the no noise out of Germany is that Tottenham are looking at Benjamin Sesko. And if that he's the guy for me, if we can get him, like I'm, I'll be over the moon. He's young as well. I think he's 21 years old, 22 years old. He's got his whole career in front of him. Doesn't phase him at the Champions League level. He scores in scores goals at the, in the Bundesliga. Just a really, really good, a really good talent. Whether he'll want to leave, I'm not sure. There was no reports regarding his potential interest in leaving, but something uh, to keep an eye on. And like I say, put him on the on the short list of strikers uh, that you'd like to see here. If I were you, talking about the team over and thing. Well, look. On the left-hand side, we've got Nico Williams. He is the on-again story. Today, it's, there's a 55 million euro release clause. Tottenham are willing to pay it, so a Newcastle. Williams is interested in going to the Premier League. Despite him only signing a new contract in December, that was really to protect the club and the players' best interests. He sort of did the club a favour. But in reality, he's not going to be at Atletico Bilbao for... Uh, much longer, in all, in all likelihood. And look, a wonderful, wonderful player on the eye. Okay, what I'll say to you, I'll put a screenshot up right now, which you're going to probably hate me for saying it. If you're someone who doesn't like Timo Werner and you're someone that wants Nico Williams, then you'll probably hate me for putting this stats screen up. But I'm going to put an overlay that will show you over the last 365 days, Timo Werner's performance versus uh, Nico Williams's performance in all meaningful measures of what you'd like from a attacking left winger. And Timo edges it. On average, he's, better, he's a better all-round player. Nico Williams is brilliant at getting the ball at the end of the move, driving with it, getting into spaces and creating, shush, and then creating actions that lead to shots or goals, which is you know, ultimately all that matters. If you get given the ball and more often than not, something that you do leads to a shot on target or a goal, then you're doing your job. The question mark for me and for you guys is, is that all you would expect from him or do you want your wingers to be more involved in other things? And you want, was it rigid fluidity or fluid rigidity where everyone kind of moves around and stuff? Well, if Nico Williams is going to move around, look, don't get me wrong, he can play on, on either wing. But if you look at his stats, he doesn't get on the ball that much relative to other, other players in his position. He doesn't have fantastic passing success rates. He is the kind of end of the move. He's the guy who slam dunks the alley-oop or whatever, to use a basketball phrase. I'm not even sure if I used that one correctly, so forgive me if I didn't. <laughs> but Nico Williams, look, I would love to have him here. But if we're arguing about... You know, do we keep Timo Werner or do we improve on Timo Werner? I personally think we keep Timo for 15. You sell Brian Hill. I'm sorry it hasn't worked out for him here. You hope that you get 15 for Brian Hill. You put that on, on Timo Werner. That's your initial swap. And then you've got one more spacer over there anyway for help because Perisic left. And I think you can go for someone like a Nico Williams. But if you're going to go for a Nico Williams at 55 million with a year release fee, there's other players out there who I look at and think are very similar. Very, very similar, direct, one-on-one, -on -one, dribble specialists with a lot of decent output. There's, there's hundreds of people that are direct players. The difference between the good and the great are the ones that can look up at the right time and release the ball at the right time. Nico Williams is one of them, but so is, 
on paper at least, Antonio Nusa. So are a lot of players that are available. And 55 million will be a healthy size of the budget. And I don't suppose Tottenham really will want to go for that and a Benjamin Sesko. And one of these other two guys, which I'm going to talk about today, just for argument's sake, the other player, these two are also from Leipzig, Danny Almo. This came out a couple of days ago. I should have put it out then, but I've been sick. Look, I won't spend too much time talking about him. If you've watched my channel at all, you'll know I absolutely love Danny Almo. He is just a brilliant, brilliant player. He, he He's like a kind of a, a slightly lesser version of Florian Wirtz for me. Like, he just hangs around in the 10 in the attacking midfielder role, but can drift left, drift right, drift into spaces. You know, fast and the furious is the amount of drift he does. And... You know, it gets it pops up with meaningful, meaningful contributions in goals and assists every single season. I think he's already on over 10 GA combined or 12 GA combined. I think I'll correct it on the screen if I'm wrong. And look, he's a player that would fit this system. He, he is the fluid rigidity you're looking for. He's the guy that can float. He's the guy that can come pick the ball up from deep and spray passes left and right. He's also not that afraid of getting stuck in for a small guy like he's quite feisty from what i've seen of him and from what i remember specifically about one game he's not afraid to have a crack and look i do think that james madison needs support this this summer if if lo celso is going to leave and it looks likely that he will and that's a shame for what it's worth because i think he's a brilliant player but you can't reward a guy with a new contract who hasn't been fit for more than 50 percent of the minutes I maybe I'm not sure if that's a stat that I've just made up, but he's not fit enough for me to uh, to be rewarded with with a new contract. And so, if you let him go, then you need a ten to come in and compete. And for me, Danny Olmo can not just do that role; he can do a bunch of different roles as well. One of those sorts of players that you just know, and will fall in love with, and he'll probably fall in love with Angie's football as well because it allows creative freedom that sticks to principles but has the ability to be dynamic in how those principles are applied which is something that for me i'm looking forward to seeing how we solve for this summer so those are the three the three uh transfer sort of target if you like for for, for from this week or this or this this video but the last one is also at rb leipzig and it's none other than right back and right-sided centre-back, predominantly right-sided centre-back, Simakan. This guy... <laughs> I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to go as far as to call him the, the next Mickey van der Ven. He's 23, I think, 20, 22, 23, maybe 24, maybe just turned 24. He's young, but not super young. He's six foot two, and he's, he can sprint faster than Timo Werner. Right, he was. The, I think he was the fastest player in the Leipzig team when Timo was there and Timo was clocked. And we know how fast Timo Werner is. So, if we're looking for another centre back and we're trying to kind of replicate as close to possible a player like Mickey Van der Ven, who obviously we've stumbled across a future world-class player, then look, Simakan. He's not quite as tall as the guy, but wow, this guy is a is a ball-playing centre back. You look at his stats. I'll throw them up on the screen as I always do carrying the ball for days, progressive passes, uh, dribbles out from the back. He loves getting on the ball as well. He gets on the ball more than any other Leipzig player consistently, which, you know, is not a surprise for a team that plays out of the back, I guess. But what he does with it is very, very useful. And, of course, he can play right back as well. And so I know we already have gone through this with Dragosin in that he was supposed to be a right-sided centre-back who can play right back. And thus far, all we've seen of him is awkward, you know, awkward performances playing on the left-hand side. And Ange says, oh, I don't care about this left-right thing. If you're a defender, you're a defender. That might be his stance on it, but I, I would imagine that players feel uncomfortable if they're playing on the wrong side because their bodies naturally turn a certain way to pass when they receive the ball or when they distribute it. Oh, when I played rugby, I was a flanker, but I was a blind side flanker. When I often got asked to play open side flanker, it's the same position, same rules, just the other side of the scrum, completely threw me off. Completely threw me off. And so I do think there is merit to the idea of, um, you know, having right and left sided sort of specialists. And if Dragosin is going to not be used in that regard, if Dragosin is going to be used 
where and when someone's injured, then how likely is it that we're going to go after someone like um, um, Simican, who's got a 60 million euro release clause? Look, I don't know. I doubt it. I'm, I'm thinking people are just putting two and two together and going, today we're going to talk about Leipzig, which is what I'm doing, so forgive me. However, the story's out there, and it's not in meaningless aggregators. It's out there in a couple of the bigger journals in Germany as well. Tottenham are very much keeping a very close eye on this guy, as are Real Madrid for what it's worth. And if Real Madrid do come calling, then you, you know, you're beaten anyway. But look, what I would say is that if any of these rumours are based on any truth at all from the people that have written them, then don't be surprised, as I've been saying, despite the, figure, the financial figures looking on paper pretty meagre, pretty like surprisingly um, dampened, they're really not, right? That what they report in profit at the, end of the, at the end of it all is factoring in all that other nonsense, all the interest, the, the depreciation. The number you really want to focus on, the, the number that investors focus on, is the earnings before interest tax, depreciation and amortisation. And obviously, investors are looking at Tottenham right now. Now, when that happens, if that happens, or even if it doesn't happen, I still expect Tottenham to have the healthiest transfer budget this summer for what we relatively need. And I wouldn't be surprised to see Tottenham spend more than £60 million, i.e. break our transfer record if the right player came along. I don't think we'll get it all done. I'm not sure if we would get Danny Olmo, Sesco, Nico Williams, whoever. Maybe we're going to get one monster signing in one particular player or position and then you know a couple of youngsters coming through you know coming in as well to help out with that regard time will tell there's a lot of suns and moons to go before the window opens before the season's done and in any day between now and then you might hear an announcement that Tottenham have been bought by whoever or invested in by whoever and then everything changes because then there's more spending money depending on how the the, the debt might be written off and I'm going to do a video on what that looks like because it's not, it's, it's not as easy and complicated to explain when I've already been talking to you for 25 minutes. So I'm going to leave it there, guys. Let me know your thoughts. Danny or Almo, yes or no? For me, 100% yes. Nico Williams, yes or no? For me, like the player, but don't expect him to be everything. And check out those stats. Timo Werner smashes him in most departments, apart from the key corner ones that you want from a left winger. But he's a specialist in that. He's a, he's a master of one rather than a jack of many trades. He isn't the best at everything else. There's lots of other people that can do what he can do in that role. Don't get sold on the name just because it's quite flamboyant. Simakan, I don't think there's any chance of it happening. It'd be great if he could, because he's amazing. And Benjamin Sesko. <sighs> hey! Love that guy. I wanted him two years ago. We'll see what happens. Let me know your thoughts, guys. Like, subscribe, and comment. And as always, bye-bye.